Well, good morning, and uh, thank you for that introduction. It's such a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be in Berlin, uh, but it's a particular pleasure to be at this 15th anniversary uh, of WISE.DA. WISE, of course, has been a force for change on both sides of the Atlantic for such a long time now. Uh, it served as a critical support network for women getting their start in the field of national security, it's hosted countless substantive discussions featuring women scholars and policymakers, many of them here in this room, and provided many important training opportunities as well. And some 20 years ago, WISE played an instrumental role in my own professional path. After I graduated with my MA, WISE in Washington paired me with a mentor who helped me navigate Washington. And when I returned to the United States in 1998, after spending some time here in Germany, WISE helped me find a job back in the United States through its regular monthly job postings. And it was through WISE that I first met Michelle Flournoy, many of you know her, who became both a friend and a mentor to me. And Michelle was the one that brought me into the Obama administration in 2009, into the Pentagon, and I still call her quite regularly for advice. I suspect many of you have similar stories about the impact that WISE has had on your career. As for this particular chapter of WISE, I was thrilled to see the emergence of WISE.DA 15 years ago. And since then, I've enjoyed periodically attending and speaking at some of their events. And I've been inspired to hear the stories about the impact that this organization has had on the next generation and on the current generation of women leaders in the field. Thanks in part to organizations like WISE, women have made so many important strides in recent years and decades. They've increased their representation across the highest levels of government, academia, and industry. Sensitivity to diversity and inclusion in national security institutions has also increased. More women are seeking elective office than at any point in our history. After last week's midterm elections, the US now has more women in Congress, over 100, than at any point in our history. And that election also saw many, many other firsts, the first two Native American members of Congress, both female, the first two Muslim American members of Congress, both women, and the youngest woman ever elected to office, as well as the first refugee elected to Congress, who happens to be a woman. Despite these many achievements, though, much, much more work remains, which we all know. Gender pay gaps persist. Women remain disproportionately underrepresented in leadership roles. A study by the Swedish-German Albright Foundation found that the executive boards of 110 executive boards out of 160 have no female representation whatsoever. And according to another study by the Emirates Diplomatic Academy, of the 2,000 ambassadors posted around the world from G20 countries, 16% of those ambassadors are women. And so my friends, we have work to do. And I'm counting on WISE in the United States, I'm counting on WISE here in Germany, and I'm counting on WISE in other cities to continue to support and mentor women in the field of national security. As for my talk this morning, I want to use my time to talk about a subject that hasn't always been at the heart of my work. In fact, just a few years ago, if I had been asked to give an address to a group like this, I would have given a very, very different keynote address and probably focused on more conventional national security subjects, maybe the future of the NATO alliance or the future of European defense or future of the INF treaty, the list could be long. But I have to be honest with you, those subjects today feel a little bit small to me. And they feel small because of the transformative moment that we find ourselves in today. We are living in an age of disruption where the structures and the systems that worked so well for us in recent decades are cracking. 
They're cracking under external pressure, forces from within, or sometimes both. The very foundation of the transatlantic relationship, our shared commitment to democracy, is under attack. And the spread of liberal democracy that seemed so inevitable just a few years ago has now become an open question. Nationalist and nativist winds are blowing on multiple continents. Authoritarians are doing their very best to attack the democratic values that we hold dear. Liberal regimes are growing in number and in stature, and people around the world are losing faith in the very institutions that would normally help us weather this storm. Public trust in national governments remains at near historic lows on both sides of the Atlantic. In the United States, an organization called the National Election Study began asking Americans about their trust in government in the 1950s. And at that time, about 75% of Americans trusted the federal government to do the right thing almost always or most of the time. Since then, public trust in the government has dropped significantly in the United States. And for the past decade, the share of people in my country saying that they can trust the government always or most of the time has not surpassed 30%. Now, this isn't just an issue in the United States. According to similar polls in OECD countries, on average, citizens in those countries have less confidence in their national governments today than they did 10 years ago. And in some OECD countries, I would cite Finland, Belgium, South Africa, to name a few, confidence in national government is plummeting. So what accounts for this shift? Why are people losing faith in democratic institutions? Well, here one can cite a whole array of factors. Externally, we have states like China and Russia, as well as non-state actors, fueling mistrust through misinformation, acts of intimidation, and coercion. And internally, everything from economic recessions, like the 2008 financial crisis, to political scandals, to declarations of war, can lead people to mistrust democratic institutions. Political leaders themselves can also contribute to that mistrust, either when they fail to adapt to a changing world, or when, in an attempt to cling to power, they promote the politics of fear and fan the flames of identity politics. Such leaders then promise their increasingly worried citizens that they will take the authority away from the institutions that their citizens do not trust in order to protect these citizens, protect them from crime or migrants or from globalists or political correctness or what they see as non-traditional values. In Hungary, Orban has restricted freedoms of expression, religion, and association, and he's undermined the functioning of the constitutional and electoral systems and the independence of the judiciary. Brazil's new leader, Bolsonaro has defended Brazil's former dictatorships, and now he's pledging to fight the establishment. There are so many other examples of leaders pledging to disrupt the status quo. I could mention my own president, who is now calling the media the enemy of the people, and he's questioned the legitimacy of our own electoral institutions and law enforcement. These kinds of populist calls for disruption can have tremendous appeal. Disruption can feel like a tonic, particularly when you believe that the system, however you define the system, has left you behind or failed to meet your needs. Indeed, some level disruption can be healthy, and in places like Silicon Valley, disruption is actually a very positive term that's thrown around with great frequency. That being said, disruption that is based on fear and misinformation erodes our democratic values and undermines the rule of law without providing viable solutions for addressing the real threats to our national security and current day challenges.
The question now is, how do we acknowledge some of the, the legitimate concerns of our fellow citizens without bringing down and disrupting the entire system? How do we restore public trust in national and international institutions that need to be reformed but not destroyed? How might the United States and Europe work together to address democratic backsliding both at home and abroad? How can we fortify our defenses against external attempts to undermine and weaken our democratic institutions? These are some of the fundamental questions that now sit at the heart of the transatlantic relations. And the solutions to these challenges are multifaceted. Let me begin by talking about the role that we as individuals have to play. First, this may sound blatantly obvious, but we need to ground ourselves in the truth. That means identifying trustworthy outlets and taking the necessary time to determine if our sources are indeed rooted in fact. More importantly, we need to call out those that are de deliberately misleading others. All of you here might know, I'm sure you do, that Muslim refugees in Germany are not, in fact, demanding that the city of Munich ban Oktoberfest, uh, October as one social media post claimed in 2015. But what will you do when you hear a neighbor or a friend promote a post like that? How will you respond? Second, we must define our values and prepare to defend them. In the past, I think many of us have felt like that was the job of our elected leaders, but our elected leaders now need our help. This isn't a time to be passive on protecting our shared values. This moment requires all of us to take on religious, racial, and social divisions and take them on head on. It requires all of us to find our voice. Third, let's work harder to avoid the trap of defending the status quo, something I've been prone to on a few occasions. It's not enough to say that the old order or the old structures or the old systems work for us. If we want to restore individuals' trust in institutions at home and on the international level, we have to be prepared to talk about the past, including the mistakes that we've made. Only then can we move to the more difficult conversations about the future, about the post-manufacturing economy, or the impact of artificial intelligence and other disruptive technologies. Finally, we must avoid groupthink. Social media has a way of trapping all of us in these self-editing echo chambers where we only hear from like-minded souls. If you are on social media, like I am, I urge you to very deliberately follow people who disagree with you. Better yet, get off social media and find ways to actually meet with people who disagree with you. All right, now let's shift to the policy side for a minute, and let me start with my own country, the United States. The Trump administration, I think, has rightly put strategic competition at the heart of everything that it does on foreign policy. But unfortunately, the administration is falling short in executing that strategy, particularly when it comes to competing with Russia and China. If the United States wants to retain its competitive edge over its rivals, this administration must embrace and strengthen our greatest assets, our vast network of alliances and partnerships around the world, and our shared commitment to democracy. By straining and testing our relationship with Europe, President Trump is weakening Americans' capacity to deter Russia and compete with China. Trump is operating from the assumption that he can bully our allies into correcting some of the imbalances in our relationship and that our bonds will not suffer. But in an era of strategic competition, operating under those assumptions, in my mind, is both wrong and dangerous. What America should be doing is leading a transatlantic dialogue about how we can best protect our democracies in the face of countless attempts to undermine them. But knowing that President Trump probably isn't interested in my advice and will likely continue to underappreciate the importance of strengthening the transatl transatlantic link, 
I would advise our friends in Europe to engage new audiences in the United States, people like state and local officials, the new members of Congress, and there are many, and various nonprofits across the United States. It's at that level that one finds a remarkable number of fresh ideas, innovation, and a willingness to cooperate. Now, what are some of the things that the two sides of the Atlantic could be doing together right now? We could do more right now to share lessons, both about the challenges we're facing, as well as the tools we've used to counter attempts to undermine our democracies. We could provide technical support to one another. We could coordinate responses against attacks. We could be working to strengthen the community of democracies. We could support ongoing initiatives to renew and strengthen liberal democracy. Forum 2000's International Coalition for Democratic Renewal. GMF's Alliance for Securing Democracy. The Carnegie Center's Reshaping European Democracy Progress at Project and the new Center for Liberal Modernity here in Berlin are examples of important initiatives to stimulate new thinking and develop viable policy solutions. Finally, let me just say a word about the European Union. I agree with Richard Youngs from Carnegie that the EU and member state governments would be smart to develop tangible, low-profile initiatives with other democratic powers to help defend and promote liberal democracy where it is under threat. For example, coordinating with India and Japan on Burma, or working with Argentina and Chile on Venezuela, or with Nigeria and South Africa in Zimbabwe. In closing, let me just say that it's not hard to be pessimistic, both about the future of democracy and the prospects for transatlantic partners to address democratic backsliding. At the same time, I've been encouraged by recent surveys that actually show an uptick in various forms of civic engagement among Europeans, despite disenchantment across the continent, with democratic institutions. And while mobile phones, social media, and technology create potential for misinformation and authoritarian control, they also present significant opportunities for democratic engagement and more transparent and accountable governance. But make no mistake, we are at a pivotal moment for the future of liberalism and liberal democracy. We must therefore challenge conventional thinking reshape and improve outdated structures, and create systems that are even more inclusive and equitable. And as we do that, I am absolutely confident that women in the field of international security and women in many other fields will be at the forefront of addressing these challenges. Thank you very much.